But there was much left to be done if black America was to enjoy the benefits guaranteed to all Americans by the Constitution. One man, Charles Hamilton Houston, believed that not only could the NAACP do more, it had to take the lead. In 1935, he left his job as the dean of the prestigious law school at Howard University to become the NAACP's first full-time salaried legal counsel in 20 years. Charles Hamilton Houston went to South Carolina with a movie camera and would film county by county the black school and the white school. And it was just this visual essay in inequality, but inequality doesn't even describe it. I mean, just the awful conditions that young black children went to school under. I mean, they had schoolhouses where there were cracks in the wall, they were crowded together on benches, and then the white school in the same county would have be a brick structure, two stories, basketball court. I mean, it was just so clearly unequal. And he would use that to show in the North to kind of get support for the campaign and really put a, a face on what segregation meant. There were still people, even the NAACP, who thought that black people simply had to improve their own worlds uh, and to make them sort of somehow better and, and more sustainable. Houston said it won't work that way. Uh, we have to basically integrate ourselves into all of the public goods and public resources that are around us. And until we do that, we're going to always be considered inferior. Discrimination in education is symbolic of all the more drastic discriminations which Negroes suffer in American life. And these apparent senseless discriminations in education against Negroes have a very definite objective on the part of the ruling whites, to curb the young blacks and prepare them to accept an inferior position in American life without protest or struggle. The discriminations practiced against the Negro are no accident. Charles Houston. Houston was convinced that the battle for civil rights had to be won in the schools, but would have to be fought in the courts. Houston knew that the Constitution, properly understood and rightly applied, would give black Americans the freedom they were fighting for. So he took the fight to the courts. My grandfather saw the courts as the ideal way to achieve equality, because if you fought that fight and you won, well, then it would be a legitimate victory, and it would be one that would be recognized by everyone, and would have the weight of authority behind it. Their hope was to build towards some Supreme Court decisions that would begin to turn the tide and open the way towards challenging uh, segregation in education. And so he had a strategy. Charles Houston, having his training from Harvard Law School, understood that judges are not going to make decisions that will overturn rulings having to do with constitutional interpretation unless absolutely not. So it was Charles Houston who became the strategist and the architect for a campaign that would gradually dismantle the precedent of Plessy versus Ferguson, the 1896 separate but equal doctrine. So they began to carefully pick cases that they would litigate, pick cases to win. And case established president. Cases that in Charles Houston's words would make plain the inequality that existed in the educational opportunities of blacks and whites and would make true equality too expensive for states to maintain. In 1936, Houston and his legal team would find a case with all the right components. Lloyd Gaines, a college graduate, had been denied entrance to the law school at the University of Missouri because of his race. Houston argued that Missouri was obligated to either build a law school for blacks equal to that of whites or admit him to the University of Missouri. Gaines became the first time when the United States Supreme Court was asked expressly, does a state have an obligation to provide professional education to people of color if there is no professional education available within that state? And the court said yes, and they ordered the University of Missouri to allow Lloyd Gaines uh, to be admitted, and it was incredibly influential. The Gaines case laid the groundwork for Houston's master plan. 
It would become the basis for the legal battles that would one day bring an end to legalized Jim Crow in America. But this one victory would not be enough for Charles Hamilton Houston. Over the years to come, Houston would pursue cases at every level, fighting against segregation in all aspects of American society. He saw himself as a soldier who needed to work 20 hours a day, and he did so very, very often. My grandfather had no tolerance for slackers or laziness or excuses. He believed in getting it done no matter, no matter the personal cost. I think my father saw himself as a soldier, as a, as a fighter in a, uh, a long campaign against, against injustice. He did not stint in his hours or in his travel or in his legal preparation despite the fact that his health was declining. After suffering two heart attacks on April 22nd, 1950, Charles Hamilton Houston died. My father on his deathbed in the hospital was given a, a book uh, written by uh, the attorney Louis Neiser entitled Peace of Mind, and that in the margin of uh, one of the pages of that book, he inscribed to me the message uh, tell Bo, uh, which was my pet name as a boy, that I did not run out on him, but that in every fight, some fall.